good morning. We're just going to let a, maybe a minute or two so we can have everybody, uh, all the participants join in today. I appreciate everybody uh, coming out this morning to the forum. This will go ahead and move ahead. Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning for SIF's April 2023 Agribusiness Forum, along with a special thank you to Amy Stone, who will be speaking with us today. I want to introduce myself. My name is Adam Hentz, and I'm a marketing communication specialist at SIFT. For those not familiar with SIFT, SIFT is an MEP partner with the Ohio Manufacturer Extension Partnership Group, who is part of a nationwide uh, public-private partnership with centers in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, dedicated to serving small and medium-sized manufacturers. SIFT is one of six affiliates in the states of Ohio. Our vision is to be a partner in the solutions and innovations for food, manufacturing, and agribusiness. We work to achieve this vision through a unique blend of drug services, a membership consortium made up of leading companies in the food space and a vast network of resources and other partnerships. Our goal is to increase competitiveness and growth in Northwest Ohio and throughout the state. The AG Forum is a platform for the use of agribusiness industries, food industries, and support organizations to promote new products and services and information to Northwest Ohio regional agricultural and food industries, professionals, commercial farmers, and hobbyists, along with individuals interested in venturing into these markets. If you have any questions during this session, feel free to go to the Q&A function and we will share your questions after Amy has completed her presentation. And a little about our speaker today, Amy Stone is a Extension educator with the Ohio State University in Lucas County, expertise in horticulture, agriculture, and natural resources. Amy is a graduate of Owens Community and University of Toledo. She began her career with Extension in 1992. While her background is ornamental landscape and urban forestry, that has taken a backseat to the work she is involved with related to invasive species. Today, Amy will be speaking with us on how invasive species can impact agriculture, our landscape, and communities. Everyone, please welcome Amy Stone. Thanks, Adam. Let me share my screen here. We were jumping around, it took the one a thing away. So let me just make sure I'm on the right screen here. The problem with multiple screens is sometimes they get buried a little bit. So let's see, do this, there we go. Okay. You should be seeing my screen, is that right? That is correct. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and I really appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, sometimes the topic of invasive species, people are like, oh, do I have to learn about something that's that's not good? Um, but I really appreciate it because the more people that know about invasive species, and you'll see we're encouraging people to really look for these invasive species um, and report what you're seeing. And so let's go ahead and we're gonna get started here. So I really kind of throw myself into whatever I do um, in my job. And so um, being involved in invasive species and kind of that, oh, I don't know if I wanna learn about that or talk about it or hear about it. And so often I found that, um, you know, fun costumes, um, often lend itself to attracting attention. And so I don't mind dressing up as an emerald ash borer or an Asian longhorn beetle. 
Um, and right now I have a spotted lanternfly costume on order, but it's just not quite right or ready yet. Um, so you can look forward to maybe seeing that out at different community events. What I want to do in the next hour is really kind of just a basic introduction to invasive species. Uh, we're going to talk about a pest of an hour of the hour, kind of one that really is devoting a lot of my attention to. And then, of course, we're going to talk about some other invasives, including plants, um, a disease, um, and other insects. I always like to start out the program by trying to engage the participants. And I know that's a little bit more difficult sometimes on Zoom, but think to yourself, or if you wanna put it in the, a chat comment, uh, when somebody says native, what words, what, what things come to mind? Um, and often people will say, you know, it's been there for a long time. It's 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 evolved. Um, it's it's been there, um, and so that's kind of some of the the terms or the ideas. Um, it's naturalized. Then on the flip side, if somebody says non-native. Um, Again, think to yourself, you know, what are some ideas or, or thoughts that you might have? And that could be, you know, introduced. So an introduction, whether that was on accident or humans were responsible for that. Um, it's not been in the ecosystem or the environment for a long time. And then finally, the other word is invasive. And so when I said non-native, you may have thought of kind of invasive. So um, something that goes wrong in the environment, um, something that outcompetes other things. And although sometimes non-natives are invasive, it doesn't mean that all non-natives are bad or all non-native species are invasive. And so this picture on the screen um, is an European honeybee. And so definitely not native to our ecosystem here in Northwest Ohio or in the United States, but definitely not invasive. In fact, there's so many efforts underway to protect the honeybee um, and what we do in our landscapes and agricultural areas. Now, I hope that nobody has experienced this rash that this photo um, indicates or shows. But sometimes plants can cause human harm, right? So this is poison ivy. And although some people may say, oh my gosh, that's horrible, it's invasive, I have a hard time dealing with it and managing it, Poison ivy is actually a native species. So in definition terms, it can't be termed invasive. And so we could call it aggressive. Um, you could call it a pain, especially if you're allergic to that. Uh, but native species, um, you really can't wear that name tag of invasive. And we, you, we call those plants aggressive. So my final question before we kind of jump in, um, and again, kind of thought provoking to get you ready for this presentation, is do invasive species increase or decrease biodiversity? And usually if we're sitting together in a room, there'll be a lot of hands that go up for decrease. And then occasionally there'll be somebody who says, well, I think maybe they increase. And as long as you, gave an answer, you were correct. So think about it when that invasive species, that non-native species arrived in Ohio, in the United States, outside of its original state of origin, um, we have an increase in biodiversity. We have a new species. But what happens with invasive species is they um, outcompete other species, or maybe they kill other species, and so it's at a detriment to the things that we want or that are native. And so ultimately, invasive species decrease biodiversity. 
So let's talk about uh, what is an invasive species. So an organism growing or living outside its native or natural range, often human introduced, whether that's on purpose or by accident. The second part though is really important. It's a species that spreads rapidly onto unwanted areas, often into our native plant systems, and it's to the detriment of other species. So they're causing some sort of ecological, environmental, or even human health in some um, situations or some, um, some situations. So when we talk about invasive species, um, we really want people to be engaged and involved. And that may look at different levels for different people. But I think as long as you have in the back of your mind, this like kind of a little invasive species um, light bulb, that whatever you're doing normally, so if you're out farming in the field, or if you have a garden in your backyard, or maybe are visiting a park, and you see something that you've not seen before, and it looks kind of troublesome. It, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, we really want you to report those. Um, and sometimes we just have peaks in populations of our native species, um, and that's okay. But if nobody reports what they're seeing in the field initially, um, those things can really build and get out of control. And so often, more times than none, the invasive species that are reported uh, for the first time or initially um, are done by residents in their backyards, in their own communities, alerting somebody either with extension, the Department of Natural Resources, or ultimately the Department of Agriculture. And so you're a key role when we talk about invasive species. Now, after this morning's talk is done and you're like, hey, I kind of like to learn more about invasives. This is a great website, invasive.org. Um, it talks about plants, insects, pathogens, and other species, and kind of talks about where they are in relationship in the United States. And so it's just a great resource. Um, you maybe if you're traveling to a new area for vacation and just kind of want to be alert to what they're dealing with and to make sure you're not bringing anything back home when you return, this has just been a really good website that I, I utilize and refer people to. The other one before we get into the meat of the presentation that I just want to mention, um, so in extension, we have what's kind of become a blog. It was originally a um, newsletter that was um, emailed back in the 90s. And then we went to actually kind of an online format and now it's in this more um, timelessness in that the, the posts are automatic. And so we don't have to wait for a Thursday to send all this information out. So it's kind of um, in real time on demand, but it's called the Buckeye Yard and Garden Line. And so if you're interested in horticulture and gardening and plants and natural resources and the environment, um, this is a great resource and you can sign up um, where it says alerts here and you can sign up as individual, um, emails that when a post is made, or you can get a summary of them in a week, uh, if that's kind of more your speed or what you'd prefer. But what I love, especially for folks up in Northwest Ohio, are reports that are coming in from educators in the Southern part of the state. We can say in you know two weeks, 10 days, a week, depending on where that report is made, then we would be seeing those things here. And so it's almost like a crystal ball. And so you can look really smart to your family, friends, colleagues, when you say, oh yeah, this is gonna happen or this should be happening right now. All right, get back on my... Okay, so we know that invasive species, um, I mean, it's been an issue from the very beginning. We are a global society and continue to be a global society. And so as long as things are moving back and forth, there's that potential or that threat for insects, plants, and diseases in the, the country of origin 
to be moved around and become problematic in other areas. Now, sometimes it feels like, my goodness, United States, Ohio, Northwest Ohio, it seems to be on the receiving end of a lot of these invasive species. Uh, but I just want to mention uh, real briefly that it is a two-way street. And so there are species here in the United States that uh, we have unfortunately uh, moved to other countries and they're having to deal with what was a native species in our area now has become non-native and, and troublesome or problematic in their countries. And so one of those examples is our fall webworm, which is really not um, a health concern with plants here in the States. Um, it looks kind of aesthetically displeasing. Um, some people will treat for it. Um, you can prune and kind of remove some of these nests in the season. But in our growing season, we tend to see the populations rise later in the year when the tree is normally shutting down. But in China, where this insect escaped to, it's very troublesome and problem problematic in their fruit industry. And so they call it the American white moth because it's not native there. Um, and they've actually sent scientists to the United States to look at native biological controls that we have to keep the, that insect in check in our environment and, and then potentially introducing them in um, China to reduce populations and be um, one of the management tools. So it just, it, it goes both ways and it really is a concern globally. Um, just a reminder, if you see something that you suspect that we've talked about today or that, gosh, I've not seen this before, please reach out and, and report because the earlier we find these invasive species, um, we have more tools in our toolbox when the populations are low and limited. Um, because often populations grow real rapidly and then there's really no um, way to, to eradicate the insect. We just have to learn to live with and manage. And so I wanted to start out with kind of the poster child, um, an insect that I was um, did a lot of outreach and engagement on was the emerald ash borer. And I'm sure if you didn't have an ash tree yourself, um, you've seen the devastation that this insect caused in our communities, both urban and rural. And so here's just some photos, um, including the purple traps that were um, kind of early detection tools that weren't the greatest, but they, you know, we were learning as we, we went along. And so it's a beautiful insect. Um, many people even though there were hundreds and thousands of these, um, it didn't, they I mean, they weren't problematic that you saw them kind of coming into your house or, you know, the populations were high. They really stuck to those ash trees. Um, and then some of the damage that occurred uh, when they were feeding and killing the ash and the telltale sign of that D-shaped exit hole. I put this picture in just to show you, because we're going to talk about another invasive insect a little bit later um, that looks different. It feeds kind of in a similar fashion to emerald ash borer, uh, but the insect, the larval stage of the insect is very different. And so this larvae, if you ever notice those in trees, uh, maybe if you were splitting ash firewood, is very flat like a tapeworm. And then here's kind of the life cycle. So those insects, um, and we still have emerald ash borer. In fact, um, I have some ash trees at my house that were part of a host study that OSU did early on. And populations are really starting to build back up because the woodpeckers um, are telling me that they're in the trees because they're coming in for that food source. So soon those um, larvae in the tree will pupate and be emerging as adults. The adults will feed, mate, and lay eggs for the next generation. And so if you have ash around, whether you're treating them or have treated them, um, really be on the lookout because we are seeing that population rise up just a bit. So thinning canopies, that flaking of the bark here in the center where woodpeckers are going in is a key sign um, if you still have ash trees and are trying to keep them alive through kind of the duration uh, because they'll probably always be emerald ash borer at low levels. 
And this is just a photo of a, a street in the city of Toledo early on that was killed by EAB and that same street looking the other way. And, and the, the, the impact that this plant or this, this insect had on the plants and our ecosystem. A lot of people ask about biological controls. And just as I had shared that China came over and was looking at what native biological controls kept our fall webworm in check, uh, these are some parasitoids that were released. Um, they either lay their eggs in the egg of the emerald ash borer larvae, or they'll drill through the bark and find the larvae and lay an egg inside the emerald ash borer larvae. So it's kind of like science fiction. It's really very interesting, but these insects are very small and they don't sting. These are just some photos that I took um, in one of the releases that I did here locally in Northwest Ohio. We also saw the, the destruction um, of ash trees coming down and we called them ash snaps and the danger that really occurred um, after the trees had died. The other thing that I wanted to mention, because some people have this um, fringe tree, which you'll see here on the bottom right-hand side. Um, this is a picture of the plant in bloom, which it's not in bloom yet, uh, but this is something to look forward to. This plant is actually related to ash, and this is the only other plant that emerald ash borer has um, laid eggs and completed their life cycle. They don't tend to kill these trees. Their populations are relatively low, but early on we said, nope, it was only ash trees. But this Dr. Don Cipollini um, has observed and done research on the fringe tree. Um, and so that's kind of just a quick brief update on emerald ash borer. We're gonna jump into the, the pest of the hour, which is the spotted lanternfly. We want you to join um, kind of our battle against this insect. And this is a map here showing you kind of where it is in the United States. And so you can see much of Pennsylvania is shaded blue. So it started in Pennsylvania and has really um, spread outward. Some of that is natural spread of the insect, but a lot of it is artificial spread by humans and transportation. Um, you can see that there are four blue counties in Ohio, and if you look really close, three of the four have a red line around them, which means they're quarantined. Uh, the, blue, um, the blue county down in the far left corner, so that's Cincinnati, um, we have a reproducing population, but the po um, it hasn't been through the system actually yet kind of legally to become quarant quarantined, and that's going to happen real soon. Um, so you can see, I mean, the insect did not fly to the Chicago or the, excuse me, the Cleveland area or Cincinnati. We as humans uh, were responsible for that movement, as well as up into Michigan near the Pontiac area, and then Huntington and Switzerland counties in Indiana. I want to drill down, though, just to kind of give you a state of the state. And so you can see here those blue counties in the first map have become red uh, with our Ohio map, but there's a lot of yellow counties. And what those yellow counties are showing are people um, just like you have reported spotted lanternfly uh, finding at least a stage of the adult or a stage of the insect. And usually it is the adult because they're the largest stage. But after doing survey work, they haven't found anything else. So we're assuming that um, the insect had hitchhiked and it was an individual insect outside of the infested area. Interesting enough in Lucas County, um, so that's probably the closest county to all of you, we found about 12 adults scattered throughout the county. Uh, a lot of them were in the downtown area, but we weren't able to find any egg masses to indicate a reproducing population. So we're high on alert um, and watching very closely. So kind of what does that look like? So this is a, a, a graph of the life cycle of the insect. And so right now we're at actually about 12 o'clock right here on the, the, the screen. They're in the egg mass stage, but we are warming up where we have seen um, in other areas the, the nymphs hatch. And so these nymphs are very tiny. They almost look tick-like, a lot of people describe them. So we're gonna see those April through June, kind of they overlap. They don't all um, 
hatch at once or emerge at once. They go through four stages as a nymph, and I'll show some real pictures in just a second. The first three stages, though, are black with white spots, and the fourth stage, they have this splash of red. They're a little bit larger in size, and that color is very attractive. And so if we see nymphs or report nymphs, often they're that fourth instar just because of that color difference. And then finally, at that fourth instar, he or she will molt into the adult stage of the insect that we see here that has wings and is more mobile. They will all, they're plant hoppers, so they hop or jump uh, with just the adults having the wings to be able to fly. Now, um, this is a video and I don't think you'll hear the, the audio, which is fine. Um, this is just a homeowner who um, was taking a picture of an infested tree in their property. And this is going to be the number one problem with a um, spotted lanternfly is the population numbers as they grow. So hopefully, oh, yeah. Mine are so damn thick. <laughs> so you can see they are just side by side on top of each other and how he can remove those. Um, when, uh, because the populations are so high. And so they are going to be a nuisance. Um, and so that's kind of our major concern, but we'll talk about the feeding injury that it can occur and the host plants. Their number one host plant, and this is pretty ironic, is Tree of Heaven or Alanthus. Tree of Heaven or Alanthus is a non-native invasive plant that we've been dealing with in the United States. So this insect and this plant actually evolved together in Asia. And so when it found that host, or that host plant um, here, when it arrived to the United States, I mean, it was almost like a homecoming. And so if you're not familiar uh, with Tree of Heaven or Alanthus, here are a couple of photos. Um, there are male and female plants. So only the females will fruit um, or have seeds, which you're seeing here in that picture in the left at the very top. The leaves are compound. And so there's multiple leaflets that make up a single leaf that could be two to three feet in length. Um, and at the base of each of the leaflets here in the photo on the right hand side, you'll see, get my cursor over there, these little glands or nodules. And sometimes it's hard to see them, uh, but you can always feel that little bump. And so sometimes people get the leaves confused with let's say sumac or maybe walnut that also have compound leaves, but neither of those other species have those little nodules. The other thing with Tree of Heaven, um, if you've not dealt with it, um, it has a really rancid, like peanut butter smell. And so when you um, kind of like crush up the leaves or if you cut into the stem, you can really smell that distinct odor um, that is specific to that tree. Here's a better photo of a female tree in fruit or in seed. And so it really is kind of beautiful with the shades of pinks and maroons turning to brown. And then there's an up close picture of the seeds. These trees are problematic in that a female tree can produce like 300,000 seeds in a single season. And so they're also prolific um, root sprouters. So if you cut down the tree, um, one of our forester uh, faculty said hundreds of its relatives are going to come to its funeral, which means those root sprouts will come up and instead of one plant, you will now just have a ton of plants because all of that energy is going to go up into the production of, of other plants. The other video that I want to show you, um, so this is um, spotted lantern fly on grapes, which is their second favorite. And what we're going to look here um, at is the insects are feeding on the stems. And often, if you look closely, you'll kind of see this almost looks like rain or a liquid kind of squirting across or spraying across. And I think it's this one that we see. Yep. So right there, if you can see that, that is honeydew that this insect is producing. 
and they are prolific producers of honeydew. And so that's the other nuisance factor that we're trying to prepare people for. So as they feed into the stems, they're processing the sugars from the plants through their body and it comes out the other end in a term we call honeydew because it's, it is kind of sweet from the sugars. And so often insects that produce honeydew, it kind of just runs down or just goes down the plant. You may have seen it even on house plants if you have like a scale infestation or aphids um, or mealybugs. But this, it almost squirts out like a um, squirt gun. And so we've had people that are been out in the field in an infestation on a wonderful sunny day, having to get rain gear on, not because of rain, but because of the honeydew and that stickiness that's getting all over. The second thing that happens is, so whatever's in that vicinity will collect the honeydew, and then a black sooty mold will be attracted to that. And so everything kind of turns a blackish moldy color. Um, it's not super harmful, but if it covers up entire leaves, um, it can reduce photosynthesis, but it's just a mess. So if you have a grill that's maybe underneath uh, where the insects have been feeding, you're going to have to like power wash and scrub that off or on a vehicle and things like that. So what you're seeing now, and you're probably already was, were kind of drawn to it as I was talking, is this is, they will feed on over 170 different host plants. These are some of their favorites though, and when the insects are feeding. So if you have roses in your landscape, the nymphs, those very small nymphs are gonna feed, let's say in May and June, but the rest of the season, they're not attracted to roses. So, you know, if you're scouting, I'd look for your rose in your roses early, but not later. Notice grapevines and tree of heaven, all stages of this insect are gonna feed on those and find those as a, a preferential host. Now, if you look at black walnut and butternut, Late, late nymphs, so June, July timeframe, but they tend not to see adults on those plants. But now we're looking at a shift. So river birch, late nymphs and adults, willows, same thing, sumac, same thing. And then maples, the nymphs don't seem to be interested in those, but adults definitely are. They will also feed on apples, often as adults kind of later in the season. And so just imagine going to a you pick orchard, or if you are an orchardist and you go out to see your trees and you have hundreds and thousands of these, they're only gonna be collecting on the stems and the branches where they can pierce in to that tissue where those sugars are. They're not gonna eat leaves. They're not gonna be on the fruit, but you could get a collection of honeydew and that sooty mold uh, because of their feeding injury. The photo on the bottom left is of Alanthus, so not quite as covered as that video that I showed you earlier, but again, lots of insects. And then the insect on the right, this was taken in a vineyard, and you'll notice the placement of these insects are actually on the ground. And so this vineyard owner um, treated their crop with an insecticide, um, and they are pretty easy to kill, which is the good thing, but it's gonna be additional timing and additional applications in areas like our vineyards and our orchards and our hop yards, um, just because they um, are gonna be feeding at different times than our traditional pests have been. So we'll probably see an increase in cost of these items because there's gonna be an increase of inputs at the, the grower level. So let's take a look. I've got just some photos. I mean, they truly are a beautiful insect. Um, you don't tend to see that red underwing unless they open them up and they use that as a defense mechanism. The adults are about an inch long and about um, an inch and a half to two inches wide, especially with her wings once they're spanned out or his wings are spanned out. I had mentioned their plant, um, they, they suck the plant sap. They are poor flyers, although they have wings. And in fact, they like to climb up as high as they can and kind of catapult and glide. And so looking at utility poles, tall trees or buildings, um, I mean, they're not gonna feed on the, the buildings and the utility poles, but it gets them up and then they can move to find other food sources. 
They're also strong jumpers. You may have seen a YouTube video of a woman who used, I think it was like a Starbucks cup with those domed lids with the hole in it. She was using those to collect them because what happens is she, you put them up near them and their reaction is to kind of jump or to flee. And so they were jumping right inside her cup. Here's a picture and I use this one in the center especially. So this indicates or shows kind of that piercing sucking mouth part that they use. So those adults are gonna lay eggs. And so right now we're still kind of in that stage where we're seeing egg masses in infested areas. You'll notice that large um, photo on the right. Those are the, the pictures are the eggs um, right here. So they are laid in rows. Um, some people call them chains. Um, and they can be between 30 and 50 eggs. Um, in that mass that she lays, and then she covers them up. And so this is a little bit later in the season that covering has kind of cracked and weathered. But over here on the left-hand side, you can see it's kind of smooth and shiny, but it just ages and weathers. And so it has a little bit of a different look as the season goes along. So right now, if you were to see an egg mass of the spotted lanternfly, this is likely what it's gonna look like. A little bit more flat, more aged. It almost kind of looks like mud or concrete. Here's just some photos kind of up close of those nymphs. Um, and I'll show a picture in just a second of their actual size. I mean, these are actual insects, but they're blown up. So they look huge. Um, again, four instars or stages that they go through. And you can see here the smaller ones um, that were collected in just a, a vial of alcohol. Here's just a picture of them collecting on the stem um, of a tree of heaven or a lanthus. Um, so obvious in numbers, but they're still quite small. Here's a couple on the top of a stem that are kind of sunning themselves. I had mentioned that sap that occurs um, from their excrement or that honeydew. And sometimes you'll see this white mold at the base of the tree where that honeydew is collecting. So just a refresher on kind of their life cycle. So from egg to um, nymphs, going through those four stages and finally the adults. The adults will be killed uh, when we get a frost or a freeze and can't overwinter. So the only stage of this insect that will overwinter um, is in that egg mass stage. I put these up just real quickly because whenever there's a new insect on the radar, you know, every insect that people see are like, oh my gosh, is that spotted lanternfly? And so Virginia Tech has done an awesome job about some of these lookalikes. And you may think, Amy, those don't look anything alike. I do have to say this tiger moth, I mean, there's, a, there's some comparison to kind of color, but really not the pattern. Um, but if you're out in the field and you see this large insect, you may, you know, hopefully think, is that spotted lantern file like Amy was telling us about or sharing that information? They've done the same with the, the nymphs and these are all available. Um, you can just put spotted lantern fly lookalikes and they'll take you right to their website. They've also done that with eggs. So what can you do? Stay up to date uh, because I think this year is gonna be a big year in additional fines in the state of Ohio and then report what you're seeing. You can just, uh, you know, maybe adopt a tree that you look pretty frequently at to see if there's any signs or symptoms. Um, we do know that this insect is following um, interstates, rail lines. Uh, we find it at gas stations, um, truck stops. The rail cars are very problematic. Um, we know that that's how the infestation in Jefferson County arrived and the fines in the Cleveland area and Lorain County um, and Hamilton County all have rail lines um, associated with them or in very close proximity. Additionally, the nursery stock, uh, there are quarantines in place, so we're not getting nursery stock from infested areas that have these hitchhikers. We encourage campers, um, you know, to if you're in an infested area to check that camper or vehicle. And then of course, firewood could be another source of movement. Pennsylvania has done a bang up job about um, getting people in, involved in killing spotted lanternfly. So see it and stomp it, squish it, smash it. Um, they've, they've done it all. In Ohio, uh, before you go on your killing spree, make sure that if you detect it, collect it. 
And that collection could be a photo if you can't access or reach it. It could be the actual insect itself, and then you want to report it. I share this one. Uh, this was one of the adults that was found in Lucas County um, at Swan Creek Metro Park. It was a park visitor that saw it and thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is that invasive species we're on the lookout for. They killed it. And then they're like, oh, wait, I got to report it. So even though it was stomped, I mean, we can see that it was spotted lanternfly. All right. So we've got a, a, a little more time to talk about some of the other invasives that you may be seeing. Uh, the first one is a plant that I just want to mention. Um, it's oriental bittersweet, um, sometimes known as the kudzu of the north. Um, this is very prolific um, and becoming an increased problem, especially in our woodlots, but sometimes even in landscapes. You can see the stems will actually twist around other plants to kind of grow up. And it'll grow about, excuse me, 60 feet in a, over its lifetime. And so it'll grow up into the canopies and kind of cover the canopies. Um, it, we have an American bittersweet and you can see the photos of the fruit kind of in comparison. We do know, though, that they're hybridizing, and so the species are crossing. And unfortunately, a lot of that genetics in the crosses are that aggressiveness of the bittersweet. So managing, trying to remove, reducing the number of berries that then the birds can um, move from place to place is super important. And if you have questions about any of these, I'm going to share my email at the end. You can follow up and say, hey, would you, can you give me a fact sheet on that? I'd like to have more information. Kudzu, uh, we do have kudzu in Ohio. Um, it's coming up from the south naturally. Um, it's um, uh, changing that it can overwinter and it actually can flower and fruit in our shortened season, which was one thing that maybe we thought, oh, we don't have a long enough season for it to reproduce. Uh, but unfortunately it has evolved and um, it is doing that. Uh, this, these are photos from St. Clairsville, Ohio. We also have a population in Cleveland, Ohio. This one was an introduced plant, uh, first for forage and then for erosion. Um, and it was, it was highly planted um, as a plant that would do well in situations, but it did so well that it took over. So then it was removed and, become, and put on the invasive species list. So Beautiful plant, unfortunately, um, three leaflets. It kind of looks like poison ivy on steroids. But if you see this in Northwest Ohio, please let us know. I haven't confirmed its um, locations anywhere in this region specifically. The other plant that I want to mention is calorie pear. Um, so calorie pear has been in the news. And right now, if you see white flowers, white trees um, blooming um, in kind of the sides of roads, um, disturbed areas, it likely is an invasion of calorie pear. In January, 2023, it became illegal to buy, sell, plant this species in the state of Ohio. Nobody is making anybody remove plants, but some homeowners associations, some homeowners um, are doing it uh, proactively to reduce um, these reproducing populations. And so you can see some photos here um, of what we're seeing, high seed uh, production, which the birds then will spread. And I mean, this is kind of what we're seeing right now in Northwest Ohio, although the photo um, from the expressway was down um, taken near Columbus. The other thing that we've seen is this plant is reverting um, back. And the plants that are coming up through this cross and um, through nature, um, have th some of them have thorns, which can be very dangerous. So be sure you're wearing safety glasses when you're working, um, trying to remove those from areas. All right, so Asian jumping worms. Um, so these worms really don't jump, uh, but we do have them here in the state of Ohio. And unfortunately, they're getting moved around um, by people who are sharing plants, um, compost, mulch, if it's not heated up properly and going from area to area. 
Um, you know, earthworms, we have that thought that they're good, um, but this earthworm can get rather large um, and it only is gonna feed in the very top surface. And so it's just gonna consume the leaf litter, the mulch um, and really change the soil. And you'll see here, the one way to kind of identify a difference, and I'll have a comparison next, is this clitellum right here that is often a cloudy white or lighter color. Now our European earthworms, um, and it's flush with the body. So when we compare that to our European earthworms, often, um, again, it's a lighter color or a different color, but it's raised right here. So this is the European earthworm, one that we're pretty familiar with, um, where this is the Asian, uh, where the clitellum is flat and more of a cloudy white or white color. Current distribution, um, and this map is just a little bit dated, uh, but you can see we are in the area where um, these have been found. Um, if they're working on um, control options, including some diatomaceous earth or biochar. Um, but if you suspect that you have them, uh, please let somebody know. And then we can kind of help you through some best practices, especially if you are into landscaping, into gardening, uh, because these insect or these worms will actually feed on the roots of the plants um, and then can be moved from place to place um, as you either pull out and compost certain plants um, or maybe share certain plants that have um, reproduced in your own yard and you want to kind of share the, that wealth. Okay, got a few more minutes uh, with a few more that we're going to cover. The first is the beech leaf disease. Um, this one was first found in the state of Ohio. And what we're looking at is this banding of the leaves. I'm gonna put up a second picture here. And so as the season progresses, those bands become more um, predominant, um, darker green in color, but they're almost like kind of corrugated or have a thickness to them. Uh, the tissue can also then ultimately turn yellow and necrotic and die. So then you'll get these uh, brown bands. The leaves will kind of wilt up. Ultimately, we've seen plants die over time. Uh, this happens both in the forest, so our natural woodlands, as well as in landscapes. Um, that shriveling and puckering is kind of illustrated here with some brownness. Uh, they called it beech leaf disease uh, because it looked kind of disease-like. They're still trying to learn all about this um, particular problem, but recently discovered a nematode that is found in plants that, have ex that are exhibiting symptoms. And so they think that the nematode is playing into what we're seeing. Although there have been some situations where they've identified the nematode on plants that aren't showing any symptoms. So it's really the scientists, graduate students, uh, postdoc students are working really hard to figure this out. So this is an electron um, photo or image uh, taken from a microscope of the beech leaf ne and the nematodes. And so, I mean, just they're can be thousands and thousands of them. This shows you kind of an early um, state of where this particular problem was being found. It was first found in Lake County, Ohio in 2012. And this is kind of a, a map in of July 25th, um, two, 2022, so last summer. You can see we do have a magenta color here. Um, this is Fulton County. Um, it was found and confirmed in Gull Woods. Um, and so to me, it, I wonder if the nematodes or whatever the problem is, is being moved obviously through humans, maybe, you know, boots. Um, potentially it could be birds as well uh, with the nematodes but maybe somebody visiting an area that was infected or infested and then went to see another wood. So, you know, maybe visiting Holden Arboretum where we know it's at 
and then going to see, you know, something at Gull Woods. And so just being very cautious and watching, like when we're in areas that we have this, wash your boots, um, you know, do really good, you know, cleansing things before going to another area. Okay, this one, um, I was just gonna, there's some, some word slides here, but this has not been found in um, Ohio yet, uh, but there are three counties in Michigan, just to the north of us that have been found. This is the box tree moth, um, and it is going to impact our boxwoods. And so if we look at it, it was found in Clinton Township, which is in Lenaway County. Um, so they have, or they've um, quarantined Lenaway, a portion of Monroe and Washtenaw County. Um, this is what the insect looks like. And so this is not really a natural resources pest of concern because it's only going to attack boxwoods that are more landscape oriented plants. Um, they are, have these beautiful wings uh, with that, that have kind of like a scale look to them. They have two different color phases that are, can be confusing. Um, so same insect, just two different looks. But this is the stage of the insect that's very damaging or um, causing the injury. And so these caterpillars are feeding on the leaves of boxwood. So early on, um, you see this brownness. And I keep this photo in here because sometimes we see some winter injury uh, on boxwood. And I've gotten some samples in this spring already that could kind of look like this, but it was actually winter injury. We also see uh, some insects, including boxwood leaf miner, that is, is very common, but could again, give that look at this stage, so early on. Uh, but really nothing else looks like it um, at this stage. And so, I mean, the, the leaves are totally um, eaten, and so it's just the veins that remain. And so here are the, the caterpillars doing that extensive damage and what it could look like. Um, and so this is a lot of caterpillars doing a lot of feeding. And so hopefully we find that before this is what your boxwood looks like. This photo just has um, kind of their pupil stage and the egg masses. So they lay those eggs on the actual leaves and then the insects as they hatch and begin to feed. There are some monitoring and trapping protocols. Um, our nursery growers are very concerned because boxwood is a very common plant in the nursery trade. So just kind of be alert to that. <clears throat> All right, I know we're winding down and I see that there's a, a question that we'll get to before the end. Just want to give you a brief update on um, spongy moth, which was also um, commonly known as the gypsy moth. Um, so it had a name change um, last year. This insect, and I love these um, historical pictures. <clears throat> so this insect uh, was actually brought to this country by this French scientist. Um, he wanted to create silk. And that was his area uh, outside of, or in Massachusetts. Um, the Insects escaped. Um, it took about eight years for them to become established. Um, there's been eradication programs over the years, uh, but now we're just learning to live with this insect. But he left like in 18, what would have been 1875, uh, once the populations grew. Um, he never came back to the country, but we've had this gypsy moth or spongy moth ever since. And one of my favorite photos, if you look really close, so these are men um, doing early eradication efforts, uh, probably not to OSHA standards, but they were removing and scraping um, egg masses. And so they really tried everything in their power to stop this insect. And I also mentioned this one um, just real briefly is because right now the eggs are hatching. Uh, they hatch at the same time that our red buds are blooming. So if you have a population, the caterpillars will be hatching. They're very, very tiny uh, right here as they hatch, uh, but they will become these large eating machine monsters with rows of blue and red dots. Um, here's a, there's pupil stage and then the adult, this is the female that's laying eggs for the next generation. This is just kind of gives you a, a state of the state of, of Ohio as it relates to spongy moth. 
So we're primarily, most of us, I think, are probably in the suppression zone, this red zone. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I... Uh, there is a slow the spread zone, and then there's also an eradication zone where they'll do uh, e small eradications um, to slow the spread of the insect. And then I'm just going to show this one photo, and then I want to open it up to questions that you may have. Um, this is Asian longhorn beetle, um, and I saved this insect for last because this is a success story in many areas. So this insect has been eradicated from places in New York, New Jersey, um, also in Chicago. And we are underway in an eradication effort in Claremont County, Ohio, that's getting pretty close. Um, and so this is a tree killer of maples and 12 other um, species of trees. So it has a pretty wide host range. Um, it feeds inside the tree, just like emerald ash borer would, except not just underneath the bark, but it goes into the center of the tree. So you'd see these two stages, the adults out and about, the larvae inside. And this is the one that I wanted to show that comparison. So not flat, not like a tapeworm, like emerald ash borer, but kind of more beefy, what I call the Michelin tire man. And the last picture that I wanna put up here is actually, they have a perfect round exit hole that goes into the tree. So you could take a number two pencil and just stick it right in. Um, and that's pretty distinguishing characteristics um, on a living tree or recently killed tree. Um, and I said, this was the last one, but I do wanna show, so these are those other host plants. So I mentioned the maples, in Ohio, 98% of the trees that have died because of emerald ash borer have been maples. But they also like horse chestnuts and buckeyes, elms and willows, and I'll let this, um, that list up there. So we probably all have trees that potentially are at risk. So keep an eye out for this one. But again, um, kind of that, I wanna end the presentation on a positive note that one, an invasive species that has been eradicated or eliminated. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there's any questions um, that people have. So first question is from Karen Wood. Is it possible to transfer tree pests and disease to my trees from buying and spreading commercial mulch? Yeah, so um, primarily we're going to see those insects like the earthworms um, in more compost material. And so you just want to make sure that whoever you're getting your compost from, and even mulch, um, it heats up properly that these other, that insects and diseases are killed um, as a result. So, really good question. Um, often, Commercial companies have to maintain soil temperatures um, as part of their record keeping. And so you could just ask them for that. If temperatures exceed um, 130, 140 degrees, uh, those organisms will be killed off. Uh, but even then, uh, when you're adding in, um, I always kind of just make sure that you're, you're watching as it's going in, what else is coming, um, and then monitor that that particular year just to make sure that you haven't introduced something in that manner. Good question, Karen. And uh, just an additional note, just feel free to put in some questions and answers into the function down there. Amy should be able to, happy to address those. I do have one that says, um, maybe share a few of the invasive species to look for for area farmers that might be kind of look out for this year or might be new to the area. Absolutely. And I, th I think, um, you know, spotted lanternfly, depending on what crops you're growing, um, because it has a wide host range, would be very um, important. And then I think also what you're often in the fields we're looking at are weed pressure. So palmer amaranth, um, mare's tail, um, a couple of the weeds that I had mentioned, um, maybe not so much in a field that's actively growing. Uh, but in the areas, if you're doing any conservation practices, so like the, the ornamental bittersweet um, could kind of encroach in that. 
Another plant that I um, didn't mention in today's presentation, but we are starting to get some phone calls in is lesser celandine. Um, often it starts out more kind of in a shady woodland setting. Um, it likes moist areas, but I've seen it move into full sun. Um, and we see that in the early spring, very glossy kind of heart-shaped leaves with this yellow buttercup, buttercup type flower. Um, and once it established, it's just a carpet. Um, and what it ha what happens is it then um, outcompetes all of our spring flowering plants, our native plants that we really want to have and enjoy. And another question, what do you consider when selecting products to control these uh, basic species? Yeah, so often I will refer to an extension publication or fact sheet. Um, just so it's the latest information and it's information that's going to give you the best control because we do know there are some products on the market that might be labeled, but they might not have the best efficacy. And so we want to make sure that the treatment is going to work. Um, the other thing is we don't want to be using the same product over and over and over again if it's going to be a repeat treatment. Uh, because sometimes they can build up resistance. And so it, it varies um, on you know, the, the plant, the disease, or the, the insect itself. Uh, but using those fact sheets and references are really important because they will give you what works best and then also the best timing for that. Um, I had mentioned gypsy moth uh, with them just hatching or spongy moth just hatching. Um, once they've all hatched, that's going to be the ideal window to treat. And you can actually treat with an organic insecticide called Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. But as that caterpillar gets larger, you're going to be limited to what you can treat with. And once they're like that large insect with the blue and the red dots that I showed, that monster feeding machine, chemical treatments really are not going to be as effective. So being alert um, to what you have and the timing of their life cycle is so important. So if you have specific questions, um, please let me know. Um, I don't know, can I type into the chat for everybody to see, Adam? I believe you can do a type and answer. Um, let's see. You know what, it looks like I can send it to host and panelists, but not to all participants. Okay. Do you have access to do that? Um, you, you can go ahead and send it to that and then I'll send it to everybody. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna send, put that in there. So if you have specific questions, please let me know and I can um, either send out the Ohio State fact sheet or um, another university um, if we don't have one here. Uh, one other question, have you dealt with camel crickets and how do you get rid of them? Oh, so that is not one that I've had experience with. Um, I've kind heard of people... one in Holland right now, so Holland Swan area. Okay. Um, I've heard people talk about them. I will, I could definitely um, get you information about them from one of our entomologists. <laughs> sure. They're, uh, they're quite quick. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, um, is there any additional questions anybody would like to ask or uh, feel free to? I just want to, if you know, people are typing, I uh, want to thank everybody for their willingness to, to listen for an hour about invasive species. And hopefully I've um, you know, planted some seeds and encouraged you to be more aware of what's going on in your own landscape or maybe a walk in a park or your farm fields. And if you see something that you haven't seen before, reach out uh, because again, we want to make sure that we're identifying those pests correctly and early. Uh, well, we want to thank you again for speaking today and uh, thank, thank you all for your time and participating on this uh, April AG Forum. And uh, the next Agribusiness Forum will be held on May 18th. Uh, we will hope to see everyone there and you can join us. And uh, thank you again, Amy, for joining us and uh, speaking. Well, it was very uh, inform informational and um, entertaining. So thank you. Great. Enjoy the weather.
<laughs> me too.